Good morning and welcome to the first focus symposium of the WCPT 2011. My name is Duncan Reid. I'm a manual of manipulative physical therapist from New Zealand and I'm also the vice president of the International Federation of Orthopaedic Manipulative Physical Therapists. And this particular symposium titled Evidence for Physiotherapist Delivery of Effective Procedures is Come, has come out of a, a, a desire for IFOMPT to share knowledge around the use of high velocity techniques and I'm very privileged to have led this symposium with four other distinguished physiotherapists who I will introduce you to as we go through this program. So why have we chosen this topic of manipulative therapy? Spinal manipulative therapy techniques and high velocity thrust are integral to physiotherapists involved in the management of musculoskeletal conditions. The evidence for these interventions though is somewhat variable and in some areas there is significant risk. However, IFOMPT has spinal manipulative therapy and high velocity thrust techniques as integral parts of the curricula of the 22 member organisations that make up IFOMPT. Manipulation has been part of mankind for many years and the pictures on the screen before you show the growth and development of manipulation in many countries and in many different techniques. We have seen improvements from some traditional Syriax based techniques which were perhaps somewhat forceful, including significant amounts of rotation, particularly in the management of the cervical spine, often accompanied by the therapist holding the foot end of the client as well as the head end. And perhaps now we're progressing to more refined techniques which place less stress on certain parts of the body and we think this is a good direction to head. So let's just consider a definition of manipulation. Perhaps the dictionary definition to handle something or move it with your hands. In the physiotherapy world, to apply therapeutic treatment to the part of the body. And spinal manipulation, often defined as entailing high velocity, low amplitude manual thrust to spinal joints that extend slightly beyond their physiological range of motion. There are certain characteristics that we also might wish to consider and these characteristics have been summarised on the slide before you and published in Manual Therapy by Evans and Lucas. So the necessary requirements of a high velocity thrust are that the force is applied to the recipient the line of action of this force is perpendicular to the articular surface. The applied force is created, creates a motion at the joint and that a cavitation often occurs within that affected joint. This is a rather busy slide. It really just demonstrates that the evidence for such techniques are growing and our, some of our presenters today are going to expand upon this evidence base. There is also some evidence against the use of spinal manipulative techniques, particularly in the cervical spine, and a fairly well-established paper by De Fabio in 1999, a review of literature of those adverse events following cervical spine manipulation, demonstrated it was happened in about 18% of cases. The greater majority of these were chiropractic manipulations, with physiotherapy a much smaller 2%. So these events are rare but catastrophic and as a consequence of this approach some have suggested no significant benefit can be shown with spinal manipulative therapy and there's a recommendation to not use thrust techniques. Other authors such as Teal and Ricks have also recommended that the screening procedures that we use to identify patients at risk also have inherent risk in themselves. As clinicians we are also challenged by the fact that the true incidence of adverse events is not currently known. 
A systematic review by Carleso looking at adverse events associated with the use of cervical manipulation or mobilisation identified in very small number of studies that there were no adverse events. And so we cannot really draw any definitive conclusions as to how large the risk is. Should we manipulate at all? This study by uh, another review by Ernst looking at deaths after chiropractic found there were 26 fatalities since 1934 and that there may be a level of under-reporting with this particular approach. Most of these, a large number of these patients were relatively young, under the age of 40. The female gender tends to be more dominant in the adverse events than male. And the time between delivering the manipulative event and the adverse reaction is also significantly variable. And in his opinion, Ernst stated that the risks of this treatment by far outweigh its benefits. A recent study published in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation by Lever compared the treatment of non-specific neck pain of less than three months with physiotherapy, chiropractic and osteopathy. One group of uh, participants received mobilisation four times over a two-week period and another group received high-velocity thrust over the same two-week period. The results of this study indicated there was no difference between the outcomes for, for both groups. But there were some greater levels of adverse events in the manipulative group. And the authors of this paper suggested that the use of neck manipulation therefore cannot be justified on the basis of superior effectiveness. So this leaves us with some challenges as clinicians and teachers of manual therapy. Should we still be teaching high velocity thrust? Which levels of the profession should this be taught to, both undergraduate or postgraduate, one or the other? A major challenge is that if we go to the evidence, which may seem a little negative in this opening speech today, is that should we diminish its use and then have other professions take over greater control of this? And some professions, as we know, have already endeavoured to take over ownership of this particular treatment modality. So with this background, it was felt important that we have a symposium to discuss these issues. So the purpose of today's symposium is to provide information on the current efficacy of spinal manipulation in the management of a range of musculoskeletal conditions, to provide information on the current screening procedures that may reduce risk, and to provide information on current trends in the delivery of such techniques in undergraduate and postgraduate curricula. So we have some very distinguished uh, presenters today, Dr Tim Flynn, Dr Wayne Hing, Dr Chris McCarthy and Peter Westerhouse. So the format now is I'm going to introduce each of our speakers. They have approximately 15 minutes to present their particular area of interest and we are hoping to finish in sufficient time that we can have questions from the floor about this particular topic. So firstly, I'd like to introduce our, our first presenter, Dr Tim Flynn. Dr Flynn is a board-certified orthopaedic physical therapist and a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopaedic Manual Physical Therapists. He is an expert clinician and owner of the Colorado Physical Therapy Specialist Centre. His primary clientele is made up of individuals suffering from low back pain, chronic spinal disorders, failed back surgeries and chronic pain disorders. He is a partner and faculty member at Evidence in Motion and a distinguished professor at the Rocky Mountain University of Health Professions. Tim, welcome to the stadium. It's a podium. Can you just keep back? There we go. Excellent. Thank you, Duncan, and thank uh, each of you for attending. It's an honor to be here. I come from a beautiful state of Colorado, which is in the central portion of the United States, and uh, uh, it's, uh, we send our greetings to you all. Well, I'm going to switch gears and talk uh, really about the, the easy stuff, uh, low back pain. And in, what I mean by that is that uh, low back pain, uh, it's a, really a different, a different story. 
Back pain accounts for approximately 50 percent of all patients treated in physical therapy or physiotherapy uh, clinics. Um, but I think this quote uh, updated from Gordon Waddell uh, uh, back in 2003 is still accurate that, in fact, back pain was a 20th century medical disaster, and the legacy reverberates into the new millennium. And what's why this, these statements come about is uh, this fact that low back pain is both common but also uh, very costly. Uh, I, I apologize for this being a bit U.S.-centric data, but this is the amount of money we spend on spine care, uh, direct medical costs, direct medical costs on spine care in the United States. And when you put it in perspective next to cancer and, and uh, diabetes, um, you can see that that is a lot of money for a pain condition. Well, uh, let's talk first. Uh, we'll break the, the support into two uh, areas. First, that of more uh, acute low back pain, though these definitions are, are not clear. But we will say back pain of uh, fairly uh, short duration of moderate uh, severity. Uh, th there's been numerous randomized controlled trials on this subject and numerous systematic reviews and systematic reviews of systematic reviews. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on this. Uh, in a nutshell, I'll just pull a couple. Uh, the Royal College General Practitioners, 2001, their statement was, in acute and subacute back pain, manipulation provides better short term improvement in pain and activity levels and higher patient satisfaction than the treatments to which it has been compared. The recent American, American Pain Society and American College of Physicians joint practice guideline basically said if patients do not improve with self-care options that if for acute low back pain, um, the use of spinal manip manipulation is recommended and gave that um, with and it's based on moderate quality of evidence, uh, a large number of randomized control trials. Uh, the strength of evidence in the Royal College was uh, what they called three out of four stars. Well, it's very difficult to, uh, to talk a topic about this uh, when there's lots of uh, information. So I'm going to kind of switch now to this, this idea of chronic low back pain. And uh, the chronic back pain, the systematic reviews, the more, more recent one just out from the Cochrane team, has said in general there's high quality evidence that spinal manipulative therapy has a small, statistically significant short-term effect on pain relief and functional status compared to other interventions. However, they did qualify it by saying the, the effect size or the clinical, clinical meaningfulness of that uh, effect was, was, was small. In addition, the, the same practice guidelines published in 2007, when they talked about chronic or subacute low back pain, they listed it uh, among many options of, that include interdisciplinary rehabilitation, exercise therapy, acupuncture, massage therapy, spinal manipulation, yoga, cognitive behavioral therapy, or progressive relaxation. So a number of things in this chronic uh, population. Anytime we list a number of things, it clearly means we do not have all the answers, and there, there's a lot yet to be determined on this. Well, let's look at uh, just a couple trials. This is, uh, I apologize if all in the audience are very familiar with this trial, but it is the largest trial conducted on, um, on spinal manipulation. It was the UK BEAM trial, which stood for back uh, exercise and manipulation. And this trial uh, randomized uh, over 1,300 individuals into four treatment groups, that of uh, the general practitioner care, an exercise group, so an exercise-only group, and that of uh, manipulation group and manipulation and exercise. There are some bifurcations in these two groups which were really centered around where uh, the manipulation or the type of practitioner the, that, that, that occurred. But if we just get to the, the heart of the data, this is actually a, on the y-axis, the Roland Moore, Morris questionnaire, uh, lower values would be uh, a better uh, the patient doing better. And then across the, the bottom, we're essentially looking at three time points for each of the four groups. Best care, meaning a physician, best care based on practice guidelines. Uh, best care plus exercise, 
best care plus spinal manipulation or best care plus manipulation and exercise. And in green across all of these are the baseline time points. So those are the mean scores at baseline. Blue is at three months and red is at one year. And in general, you see that indeed uh, patients uh, were improving with all four groups, uh, but in fact, uh, manipulation pr provided a higher uh, level of care and actual or higher improvements, I should say. And so did uh, manipulation plus exercise actually provided somewhat uh, greater care. If we actually look at the key statements from this paper, though, I think it's worth repeating in that um, the spinal manipulation uh, package improves back function by a small to moderate margin at three months and by a smaller but still significant margin at one year. And irrespective of location is really irrespective of where that patient received their care or the type of provider that was performing the manipulation. Exercise improves back function by a small but significant margin at three months, but not at one year. And then finally, manipulation followed by exercise improves back function by a moderate margin by, at three months and by a smaller but still significant margin at one year. The other thing I'd like to highlight on this is that in um, that the cost of care, and uh, the a paper that went along with this really looked at the cost of care, and I think uh, I'll have you really uh, jump down to the bottom uh, bullet there, that really in the national health system anyway, if they could afford at least 10,000 pounds for each quality or quality adjusted life year yielded by physical treatments, manipulation alone probably gives a better value for money than manipulation followed by exercise. We have to agree, most of us in the audience, that without looking at, we're now at a point in our uh, life expectancy as physical therapists that we indeed need to look not only at the uh, quality of what we do, but also what the value of that, of that quality is. Well, we don't have general uh, specifics on the types of manipulation done in that large-scale trial. Uh, that because individual practitioners were performing that, and we, knew no, we do know there's variability among practitioners, but in general, these are common uh, types of procedures that one gets if they're receiving spinal uh, manipulations, uh, frequently a sideline type of procedure and followed by some rotation to the lumbar spine in a quick um, uh, movement. I'll br briefly talk about some work we had done back in the uh, early 2000s where we tried to say, you know, manipulation uh, has some benefit, but it clearly does not help all folks, but there's other folks that it helps a lot. And what often happens in the clinical trials is that you get, you know, regression to the mean. So in general, it works, but consistently we hear, but, you know, it's fairly marginal benefit, the the the, the amount of benefit is not necessarily high. So what we did in this study was essentially just um, we would we brought in a number of patients and we dis, they all met uh, basic criteria for being uh, appropriate for for care. In other words, didn't have any uh, red flags. But we manipulated everyone and that came in. But we manipulated them with a very uh, consistent technique. And then we looked to see who was would have a fairly dramatic drop in their Oswestry score, their function disability score. And if they did, they were done with the trial or done with this study. And then if not, they came back for a second visit. And we said, okay, you're either relatively successful or you're not. And this was the type of manipulation done. Again, uh, we would call this a lumbopelvic manipulation just because it targets that region of, of the spine. Again, if you look, there's rotation occurring, and then some thrust is given down through the, the, the innominate. On this, the basic uh, results of this initial trial was, yeah, in general, about half the people achieve a fairly dramatic improvement with one or two sessions of that, that procedure. And what you see on the x-axis is uh, Oswestry scores, or excuse me, the y-axis, Oswestry scores, and then you see the group that was successful versus those that were not. And you just say, you know, ideally, if we can identify these people uh, up front, then we'll have a pretty good idea of the patients for sure we want to give thrust manipulation to. 
Um, there were some factors that predicted success. I think in, in, in essence, you know, shorter duration, no symptoms below the knee, low fear avoidance. And what, they had some hip discrepancies side to side, uh, meaning that actually they had a relative amount of internal rotation on at least one hip. And their backs were relatively stiff based on the therapist's assessment. Um, what followed then was just a look to try to see if, if this can be replicated. And this study published in Annals of Internal Medicine was essentially, it was a clinical trial, but we embedded this prediction uh, concept within the trial. And in a nutshell, it showed that if individuals were received manipulation and were positive on that rule, that those folks had a dramatic reduction in their oswestry at one week, four weeks, and out to six months. Um, these other groups are receiving, uh, this is the other manipulation group. So this group in circles is also receiving manipulation, but they didn't have those factors present. So in fact, um, they're, they're improving, but not to the degree of those that are subgrouped into that, into that, um, uh, in, that were a priori uh, thought to be, uh, that manipulation would be effective. Uh, Dio, who's written a lot, and I often say is a therapeutic nihilist, meaning nothing works in back pain. A lot of, if you read the back pain literature, you often hear nothing works, nothing works, nothing works, uh, whether um, uh, just take your advice and be happy and, and go on. But I think we're seeing that there is, there is changes, and even uh, he noted that, you know, for these folks, it, it seems like that is a, a slam dunk type procedure. Um, it, it's sometimes hard from a perspective of uh, trying to push this out into the medical community beyond physical therapy. So this just took a look at a couple. It pooled the data from two studies, so a larger sample size, and basically showed that if you just have two factors, if you have acute low back pain, meaning it's relatively recent in nature, and no symptoms below the knee, you're li very likely to respond to manipulation. You know, nine out of ten times, you'll have a fairly dramatic improvement in that patient, which really argues for this, in my opinion, argues for this idea against the idea of wait and see and self-care. You know, it'll go away, just keep you, keep you uh, out of... Uh, out of our out of our sight. So I really think that again, you know, we set up patients for failure early on if we don't provide them relief. And uh, so this is uh, would argue that get people in early. So let's just ask the question: What factors really determine uh, whether or not a physiotherapist will use thrust manipulation in low back pain? And I think the data is compelling enough that we should be using it often. But when you look at this, there's lots of factors that uh, therapist factors based on what school of thought they come from, where they trained, uh, their lineage in the manual therapy world. Uh, there's regional variability across in the states, across states, uh, and we know across countries. There's different rates of manipulation used in low back pain, and those rates can vary tenfold from as low as one to two to three percent up to 30 to 40 percent of the time uh, utilizing manipulation for low back pain. So it's quite variable across the country. I think most of us would argue or at least believe that our decision should be based on the patient, not based on our biases or, or perceptions, but really what does the patient bring to the equation and do they have factors that say that this is the best case, best care for them and are they, uh, and is that a type of care they would like to receive? So I would just summarize the low back pain uh, literature is that if you're a physio and you are treating patients with low back complaints and you're not using spinal manipulation, then I think you, one has a, one have decisions to make. And I would urge you, if that decision is pretty clear in low back pain, you know, refer to a colleague who does. And that should, if you're treating low back pain, it should just be part of your things that you do on lots of your patients uh, that come in to see you. Well, let's switch and go up to neck pain because we actually talked a bit about neck pain uh, uh, as we went there. And, again, it is very costly and quite prevalent as well. And there's some data, I think, in, even at this conference, suggesting that it doesn't resolve in the ways that we often think it does. Um, I already mentioned that uh, spine cases in the U.S. cost a lot, and that includes neck and back pain care. 
Um, let's, since I'm here, I must talk about the Hoving trial. So let's, you know, one of the big trials really that came out on neck pain was really comparing manual therapy, manual physical therapy versus physical therapy uh, versus general practitioner care. And this trial looked at, I think the key thing I want to point out on this trial is there was not thrust manipulation. They received manual procedures, but it was not uh, cervical spine uh, thrust manipulation through that. Um, uh, the get right to the goods, the clinical success rate on those that received manual interventions was about 7 out of 10, 68 percent. So about 7 out of 10 had clinically successful um, uh, treatment, and that, that level was set a priori. Uh, standard PT, about one out of two folks did. And then general practitioner care, about one out of three. So see your PT, and in this case, you know, you have much higher likelihood if you see the manual, uh, person that's providing manual interventions. The number needed to treat was actually very low, which is a statistic that really shows how, um, in my mind, it's much more powerful because it, as a patient, you know, we really don't care about the, the, the variable, the, what these effect size are until it gets the, to the level that, hey, I'm better, and it's at a, at a high level. And basically this shows that for every three patients you send uh, uh, to someone that's providing manual procedures with neck pain, you will receive, for every three patients, one will receive full recovery and seven for standard PT. When we compare that to the medical literature, those numbers are very, very low and very, very good, uh, and good value money, good value, if you will. And this, uh, these, the, from this same data that published in BMJ was looking at this trial and what was the cost of doing that. And I apologize, I moved these over to U.S. dollars, so they're probably worth less now. But um, at the time, uh, at the time, I, I popped it in there. So I think at the time, it was basically saying general practitioner care because of all the other stuff that happens, you know, extra imaging, medications, et cetera. Um, it costed, costs more, uh, significantly more, three times more than manual PT. And again, standard physical therapy uh, had higher costs associated as well. So because they saw about twice as many visits as those that in the manual group. So suffice it to say, uh, it's effective and cheaper. Not many things in healthcare we can say that. So uh, it was more effective and less costly than standard physical therapy or general practitioner care. One other trial I'll just mention on, um, or a couple very quickly on neck pain then would be this idea, this is a randomized trial by Walker. And again, they took uh, lots of comers. And I bring this one in because this group, they did receive either um, manual procedures, non-manipulation procedures, or manipulation procedures. And they, and that, so there was some thrust procedures done. Their minimal intervention group was really education advice, lots of encouragement to keep moving, keep active, do your range of motion exercises. If you're on medication, go ahead and continue to use it. They received some placebo-like treatment, a subtherapeutic ultrasound, and exercises in the clinic just to equalize the time between the two groups. Uh, in a nutshell, here's the, the, the data that this is looking at neck disability index scores at three, six weeks, and one year and showing that indeed the manual therapy and exercise group does better both initially and it continues out to one year. Um, and that's clinically meaningful change as well from the MCID perspective. Um, another thing to look at though is, this graph's a little busy, but this is the number of episodes of care over the course of the year from, uh, so the groups that go, do they continue to seek care? In other words, where they're still seeking care for their neck complaints. The blue is the manual therapy and exercise, the red's the minimal intervention. And what's interesting is overall, if you, the minimal intervention was continuing to seek care. In other words, they had not, from the patient's perspective, they were still hurting units and still hurting, so they were going on to receive care. So the costs of that clearly are high and additional costs that are put forth if you could recoup by just giving them a, a better, uh, a better more uh, uh, procedure at the time. The last ones here then is just this idea of, uh, because there's been a discussion, we started that uh, manipulation of the neck may have some risks, and it does. So I think we, we exaggerate those risks, and we'll hopefully have a good discussion of that uh, in the, later on. But 
Um, we do know that there's some evidence for manipulation of the thoracic spine, uh, which has much lower risks in patients coming in with neck pain. Uh, this is a small trial that showed, again, that uh, manipulation resulted in better than uh, therapeutic agents in terms of pain uh, and neck disability index. Uh, so those that received manipulation of the thoracic spine did, did, did well um, in that group. But they're coming in for primary neck complaints. Here's a, uh, one other one published in uh, 2010, which essentially it was looking at a prediction rule to try to validate it. And in fact, the, the rule was not validated. But what the study shows here is, again, these patients only received thoracic spine manipulation. They're coming in with neck pain. They only received thoracic spine manipulation in the two manipulation groups. And the other groups got exercise. Your green and black are your exercise group, and your, your pink and blue are your manipulation group. Uh, the blue, they got manipulation and exercise were positive on this rule. But in essence, there was not a difference between the manipulation. And in fact, if you just look at manipulation and exercise compared to exercise only, at all three time points, the manipulation and exercise group does better. Again, thoracic manipulation, uh, range of motion exercise for the neck, no, no direct neck treatments in this study. Okay. And then finally, this idea they were, uh, this looks at the same data, and, but it looks at it from a perspective of, of, of improvement. So these folks received, had a greater than five point change on the global rating of change score, which means they're successful, if you will. And what you're seeing is the manipulation group at four weeks and six months, uh, uh, significant differences in the number of patients that had received uh, full recovery, if you will, um, so out to 60% at six months compared to the exercise-only group, arguing again for manual interventions in that population. The types of interventions would look something like this, where they're, of the thoracic spine, whether it be thoracic uh, manipulation done uh, in prone, whether it be uh, thoracic manipulation done in supine. Generally, this is thought to be uh, a procedure that, that tends to flex more. Oops, that one didn't show. Sorry about that. So this would be more of a thoracic manipulation of the upper thorax. So these, again, are the types of procedures done for individuals coming in with neck complaints in the, in the studies uh, that we just mentioned. Because often it's, we say, well, what types of procedures were, can, were done? Okay. And then just finally, um, looking, the cervical rotation was not done. So again, cervical spine techniques were not done in the trial. Though as we will talk uh, uh, later, I just wanted to present this idea that, you know, mid-range type uh, rotations. So in closing, I'll say when it comes to neck pain, if you're a physical therapist and you're treating patients with neck complaints and you're not using cervical spine manipulation, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> I would say you should be using some type of manual therapy procedures, at least thrust manipulation of the thoracic spine or some type of cervical manual procedures, because those two things, uh, you, and you should liberally work on the thoracic spine in that population. And if not to the above, uh, if you're not doing that, you know, refer to a colleague. Okay? So thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Tim. While Wayne's just getting to his presentation and slide, I'd like to introduce Dr. Wayne Hing to you. Wayne is an Associate Professor and the Head of Research at the School of Rehabilitation and Occupation Studies at AUT University in Auckland. Wayne has been a practising clinician for over 25 years. He's an accredited Mulligan teacher and has taught spinal and peripheral manipulative joints therapy locally and internationally. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you, Duncan. <clears throat> I'm just putting my timer on, Tim. <laughs> Fifteen minutes in New Zealand is a lot shorter than Americans, but uh, here we go. 
Well, um, well, I'd like to thank you for um, inviting me here and, and coming to Amsterdam again. I came here um, 21 years ago uh, when I was living in London, so it's, um, it's good to be back. Uh, it's, it's interesting, though, because things haven't changed. Um, you know, I love uh, Amsterdam. Everyone's riding around their bikes, and, uh, but you've got to watch which way you're looking. And uh, yesterday I was walking to come to here. I nearly got run over, and um, there were these two gentlemen on their bikes, and um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see, because I, I, was, I, was, um, I was interested to see why they're trying to run me over. You can see that one liked to drink, and I'm not sure, Tim, what you had on your bike, but um, yeah, it was very interesting. Well, my talk's about uh, vertebral artery and, and cervical uh, ligaments, so really what I want to do is just uh, summarise and, and up not tell you anything new, I don't think. Uh, there's, there's some nice enlightening information from, uh, that I collected from Porto. I've just been down in Portugal that Darren Rivet and Sue Reed uh, presented there, so I'm going to just uh, introduce that as well. But we all know where the vertebral artery is. We know it's anatomically related to the, to the cervical spine and the, and the foramen and its blood supply. And I think of most interest is the fact that the upper cervical uh, part of the vertebral artery versus the, the lower part are, are, are quite anatomically different. That uh, brings us to the fact that in that upper cervical area, in the C12 area, the, the vertebral artery actually takes a, um, a, a kink and, and, and a twist. And as you're well aware that uh, the fact of turning the head uh, has been related to uh, Flow changes and in inadequate flow if you if you have some uh, extreme movements of the neck. I suppose the big question for us, and through the years with all the ultrasound research, etc., is are flow changes predictive of manipulative stroke? And that's something that's been well documented in the literature. The fact is, is that uh, it is unknown. Uh, there's a, there is a paucity of methodologically appropriate studies to calculate the actual risk but the events are, um, are very rare, and, and uh, some of the information that was presented uh, before talking about the, the, the rarity of the, those events are out there. Recent uh, calculations uh, across the board, uh, here's a summary here, and you can see from chiropractic to medical to physiotherapy literature trying to calculate that risk, and recently we did a recalculation in New Zealand um, of manipulative therapists and the number of manipulations they, they did and performed and the adverse reactions across um, through the literature and we estimated it at 1 to 418 odd thousand. We know that clinically and objectively we, we test for vertebral artery and we have we have a, a rotation test that's uh, well documented in the uh, Australian Physiotherapy uh, Protocol for Pre-Manipulative Testing in the Cervical Spine, where we hold in a, a rotated position for a, uh, for a period of time and then come back and look at latency. And as well as that, the, the tests uh, predominantly in checking the patency of, a, of an artery uh, or collateral blood flow as we turn to one side and, and we're looking at the collateral blood flow. The interesting thing is, too, is that the APA, or Australian Physiotherapy uh, Protocol, has also in the recent years stressed that the fact of the clinical guidelines, uh, there is greater emphasis on clinical reasoning uh, and, and less on the actual prov provocative tests. So that's an important uh, take-home message. We're aware when we do these tests that we look, we look for specific signs and symptoms related to VBI, and you can see the, the five Ds and three Ns that we often talk about as well as that in New Zealand and in relation to the APA guidelines, we have our clinicians with, um, with recording systems in place in their practices where they look at the subjective information, they correlate that with the objective tests, which are predominantly in range rotation and held. We clear the vestibular um, components. One of the things that has also come into play where we've just remodeled this uh, information is that we're looking more at the cardiovascular subjective information now and I'm sure that, um, that uh, uh, Chris will talk further about that and then we look at marrying up making a clinical um, decision on our subjective and our objective information. Coming to the, the vertebral artery test where we hold in, in rotation uh, this is 
a little bit of um, an interest to me with the research that I've been doing. And we have a situation here of one of the patients that we've been scanning and looking at the, the clarity of the images that we get. Interestingly, the th through the literature, the flow change research is, is very um, uh, you know, controversial. We, we, see, we see a lot of studies that fl show flow changes and we show a lot of studies that show no flow changes. And one of the things that in talking with my colleagues um, in the Im imaging units that I'm involved with is that there are a lot of methodological issues. It's not only the level of the artery that they're imaging, but also the position. But on top of that, one of the big things is the actual methodology and uh, difficulties in, in doing Doppler ultrasound. And, and it's very, very dependent on, on the angle of the beam, the, the experience of the sonographer, and, and, a, and a number of other things. So the verbal artery, uh, the validity of these tests, uh, we know that there's a wealth of ultrasound research. And, and the validity um, is is very questionable. You know, there, there are false positives that have been uh, presented in the literature, and there's been false negatives. And there's also been uh, the in vivo studies for, for, uh, that have proved to be inconclusive. Mitchell's review um, in 2007 basically stated that the controversial findings of the blood flow studies highlight the necessity for caution and jurisdiction in interpreting all pre-manipulative -pre test results. What I want to highlight now is um, when we're talking about incidents, uh, Sue Reid, who's doing a PhD down in, down in Newcastle in Australia, is looking at dizziness. But one of the things that she did, and, and we talked about in Porto, was that she, she had to screen all her patients. So out of, you can see there, out of 146 patients uh, down the bottom, possible VBI was four and, uh, and at 1%. But, but in talking with Sue, what she noticed was that was on a telephone screen. And it was from a question, if you turn your head, do you have symptoms? And uh, do the symptoms feel like dizziness, et cetera, et cetera? So she took that subjectively as being a screen and they've got vertebral artery. It wasn't actually an objective test. So potentially out of 146 patients, there might have been no uh, patients that complained of a vertebral artery type symptom subjectively and then objectively. So that's... Uh, again highlights the, the, the low uh, number of patients that come through the door with, the, with these symptoms. I th it's clear that when you look through the literature at uh, a compromise or a stroke, etc., and, and a reaction to manipulation, that the arterial di dissection is, um, is a clear uh, cause. This is a slide taken from uh, Darren Rivette's uh, presentation in Porto. And I'm not going to go into further into this, but the key is, is that there is a paper that's just been, um, been published by a student of Darren's, uh, Lucy Thomas, and it looks at the risk factors and clinical features in craniocervical arterial dissection. Uh, I believe that this is, a, this is a plug for Lucy, that uh, uh, she can pay me later. Uh, but she's presenting at 1.45 today. Uh, in the uh, auditorium and looking at uh, the risk factors and clinical presentation of craniocervical arterial dissection and she's doing a pres uh, preliminary results of the research that she's carrying out. Uh, it's based around retrospective review of medical records um, from over the last uh, over a seven year period um, and um, I'm sure that she'll fill you in on that. The next part of my talk is really from vertebral artery is one of the, one of the uh, areas that we assess as well as uh, are the ligaments. And here's a number of ligaments there. We know that we've got the internal ligaments. We know we've got the external ligaments. And so what we do is we do a number of tests. We're aware that there are symptoms that are related to instability. These involve things like paresthesia um, to the lips and tongue, um, through the, the, the neural innovations of, of, the, of the ventral dorsal uh, of C2. Um, we're also aware of the five Ds and the three Ns that I mentioned before, and we're also uh, looking at cord signs. Besides the symptoms, we also often look for signs of instability. And these may include, um, when you're doing your testing, the, the, the range of motion, uh, degree of mo motion to the end feel, etc. the association with the symptoms of instability, and then often things like lateral nystagmus. The, 
the indications for ligament stability testing, uh, you know yourself as a clinician, often a patient walks in and subjectively they immediately complain of a, of a traumatic in- episode, whether it be hyperflexion, whiplash, etc. We're often uh, looking at maybe radiographic, um, radiological evidence uh, for, for, for any signs that um, that's important to consider for treating the neck, and then we're often looking for the congenital and the degenerative type uh, conditions. So subjectively, we're, we're already looking at that. We then go on and we do a number of tests. You're all aware of the, the well, um, you know, researched, reliable sharp purser, a test of relocation, which is uh, more of a, um, you know, a test that we don't often do clinically unless there are symptoms. We're looking at, at, at relief of symptoms or change. We then start to look at the alar ligaments and, and also the, um, the transverse ligaments, etc. So we, we look at uh, similar manoeuvres here. We're like we're fixing C1 and then we do flexion extension, looking at the tectorial membrane, etc. We come in and we might do um, the flexion nod. We then might do in sitting or in lying, looking at side bending to look at um, the alar ligament integrity. Again, we can do these same tests in supine, and we also look at rotation, which is stressing those ligaments in the end feel. I think the key is that I want to stress here is on the ligaments first, is that as clinicians we need to be aware of the anatomy. We have to be aware of the signs and symptoms and the indications, as I mentioned. But more importantly, what I want to stress is incorporating the testing of the ligaments and your objective testing of the upper cervical is really part of it. Traditionally, when I was taught, we did stability testing, and then we went on and did the assessment of the patient. I think as, as good clinicians who have experienced, we can incorporate that into our general testing, our, 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 our passive and objective testing. From the vertebral artery side of things, I think we have to question, does it exist? And can we objectively test it both physically and by ultrasound? Well, uh, we know that ultrasound is dependent on methodological considerations and scanning skill. I think the take home though is that the low incidence uh, is there. It's very, very low. It's probably overplayed by us in the past, but it does exist. And because it does as it exists, we have to be aware of it. We can't miss it, but also we don't need to overemphasize that. Right, so that's my message there. It's interesting that I was, um, Searching through the through papers, and uh, you know, as you do, trying to do your last minute pre- preparation and talks, like Tim was doing last night at the restaurant where we were, um, and um, I came across a paper talking about cervical arterial dissection, and um, I noticed um, there were some specific causes, and I, I want to highlight there that there is chiropractic manipulation, um, but also I noticed that there was long-standing stargazing, and um, we were doing that at the Restaurant last night, Tim. We were, so yeah, I, I, that's why I stopped you and I said you need to um, be very, very careful with that neck. But also um, prolonged telephone use. And it's amazing coming to this conference and walking around the doors and seeing so many people using your phone. So I stress that from my take home is when you go out there, just you know, um, be very careful with your phones. Uh, thank you very much. I've got one minute 33 to go, Tim. Right, our next presenter this morning is Dr Chris McCarthy. Chris is the immediate past chair of the United Kingdom Manipulative Association of Chartered Physiotherapists and a consultant physiotherapist at Imperial College Healthcare London. He is a spinal fellow in orthopaedics and investigates and manages orthopaedic spinal pain in conjunction with two spinal surgeons. He's recently published a book, Combined Movement Theory, Rational Manipulation and Mobilisation of the Vertebral Column, and is equally under stress today because he's going to get married on Friday. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Val Duncan. Good morning. Uh, I learned some other Dutch last night. Um, Good avond. Twee beer, as you believed. Ik hou van jou. En 55 euro. Something went on last night, but um, (laughs) 
So this is the slightly eggy bit. This is the bit when I'm teaching these courses where my students put their iPhone down and start listening. The, uh, the slight anxiety about the health issues, the screening issues, and the, and, and the concept of consent usually gets people uh, listening to this bit. So there are a number of questions that we should try and address. Uh, some of the other speakers have touched on these, but these are the kind of things I thought perhaps we'd try and have a look at in the 15 minutes. So does orthopedic manipulative physical therapy cause uh, cervical artery dissection? What are the risk factors for cervical artery dissection? What are the signs and symptoms? And what should be included in consent discussions? So that's what we'll try and tick through. Now, this is good news for us all. Uh, IFOMT uh, is coming up with a standards framework or a framework for assessment before the treatment of cervical uh, spines, which I think will be out towards the end of this year, if I'm right, Duncan. I imagine with IFOMT's altruistic uh, aims and objectives, it will be freely available uh, for us all. So I think, although I hasten to add, what I'm saying here is not necessarily what's in this guideline. No, it's not a guideline. This guidance, uh, I think this will be a useful resource for us by the end of this year. From that draft are some of the classic contraindications and cautions for manual therapy. So I won't go through them step by step, but I think they'd look fairly intuitive to us. On the left, the things that we wouldn't, when we wouldn't mobilize at all. I've added at the bottom there symptoms of cervical artery dissection and symptoms of cervical instability. I think generally most of us wouldn't, wouldn't do manual therapy in those circumstances. And then to the right are the things where you start to be a bit more cautious. And here I put some of the risk factors for cervical artery dysfunction and some of the risk factors for cervical instability. So you can see we're going to be talking about risk factors and diagnosis. So I thought I'd put this in. I know Wayne's mentioned this already, but for a while I'll admit, albeit I've got a PhD, I used to think a dissection of an artery was cutting it in half. Uh, I hadn't kind of made the leap <laughs> that dissection was just a gentle splitting within the layers within the artery. Uh, you soon begin to realize when you, when you realize what a dissection is, how fragile that situation is. There we have a small tear just below the intimal lining, hematoma, add a bit of atherosclerotic um, uh, fat, and it's a, a, vulnerable, uh, a vulnerable state. So first question, <clears throat> does orthopedic manual or manipulative physical therapy cause cervical artery dysfunction? Well, you can see the slide here. This paper uh, I would recommend to you if you want sort of one of those seminal papers, which is an excellent summary of the literature up to 2007, and looks at the relationship between cause and effect between cervical manipulative uh, therapy and stroke. This is an excellent paper, but of course most of the literature is on chiropractic. Their conclusion, based on three good quality case control studies, so rather than just a retrospective review of, of cases, case control studies, so going to the event and then going back into the past of those people who've had this event, and looking to see if they've had chiropractic or other treatments. These were the conclusions fairly clearly. In young folk, you're five, five times more likely to have visited a chiropractor within a week of your cervical artery dissection. There were no associations over 45. And so in terms of the figures that they came up with in 2008 here, was that for every 100,000 people under the age of 45 who receive CMT, approximately 1.3 cases of dissection will occur within a week. Thanks very much. So, it, but it's a bit more tricky than that. It's a bit more complicated than that. But it kind of gives you a flavor of the, uh, of the, the size of the, of the risk we're talking about here. Same year, as is always the way when people produce re review papers, in the same year, this paper was produced by Cassidy, which was a really large uh, case control study that looked at uh, 100,000 life years in, uh, across nine years in Ontario to look at the vertebral artery dissections. They found 818 vertebral artery dissections in that massive cohort and then again went and looked back to see where they'd been 
prior to them having their dissection. And what it introduced here was the odds ratio, the ratio of the odds of the patient attending a chiropractor, was it higher before they had their uh, cervical artery dissection, but also they looked at the odds of them attending their primary care practitioner, their, their family doctor. Now, it's a busy slide if I can get this to work. There we go. Up here, you can see the odds ratio at a month of attending a chiropractor, so 3.6 of the ratio of the odds that they went to a chiropractor versus didn't, versus 3, seeing the GP. So it brought into the, into the discussion the possibility that some of the patients where their arterial dissection is being blamed on chiropractic, they may actually have been attending with their dissection. And they went, either went to the GP with neck and head pain and they had a cervical artery dissection or with that neck and head pain they'd gone to see a chiropractor, had some treatment and that was the outcome. So it's a possible that the authors here were very keen to say, well, they didn't think there was an extra risk of attending chiropractic over and above attending a, a, a primary care physician. But I think it, I wouldn't go that far, particularly if you look at up here what the, the odds ratio was that they'd attended a chiropractor within a week. That was uh, 12. So I wouldn't go quite so far as some of the conclusions made in that paper, but it has raised the issue that some of the dissections that we're picking up as being associated with chiropractic may have already been there. So then it brings in the issue, well, are we doing the same thing as chiropractors? So if you look at the textbooks on what we do, then there's a bit of, bit of difference, but essentially we're trying to gap joints to give us a temporary bit of compliance in the way the joint moves. But certainly if you look at how often we do it, there is a big difference. This top study here was done in, in across the UK, uh, and it was a reasonably good survey of how often chiropractors manipulate the cervical spine in a week, and it was about 40 times a week as opposed to the bottom paper here, which looked at physios about two times a week. So about 5% of those patients that that chiropractor thought were appropriate to be manipped, you know, we did. 95% of the time we did something else. So it makes me think perhaps we're not approaching this in the same way, albeit the techniques may not be that different. So does orthopedic manual physical therapy cause cervical artery di dissection? Oh, gosh. It's a bit tricky, isn't it, that one, possibly. We'll come back to it. But what are the risk factors? Well, it looks like cervical, spinal cervical manipulation is probably a risk factor. But let's look at some of the more recognized ones. Spontaneous cervical artery dissection in the internal carotid artery is about 2.6 in 100,000 patients, 1.3 in the vertebral artery. So that's about one in 25,000 people will have a, a cervical artery dissection within the population. That's higher than I thought. And if you look to the left, this is the list of conditions that will up the chance, up the odds. These are recognized risk factors for having a cervical artery dysfunction, stroke dissection. Now, hypertension is in there. Hypercholesterolemia is... Um, extra um, cholesterol in the system, hyperlipidemia, too many lipids, hyperhomocysteemia is too much plasma, so increasing your blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, infection, having a migraine, history of migraine is a really high risk factor for this, but you'll note the age group, 30 to 45. Above 45, a lot of those factors don't apply. And there's a bit of debate in the literature about atherosclerotic risk factors, whether they're actually protective or not. Some, pay, some authors will suggest that having atherosclerosis ups the chance, and others will say it's slightly protective because protect you've got thicker, tougher arteries and protects you from dissection. So a bit of debate about that. But some of the issues, the other issues that Wayne has touched on here in terms of upper cervical instability, these are arteriopathy uh, features, so genetic features that make your arteries vulnerable to dissection. So people with Erlos Danlos, Marfan's, uh, osteogenesis, imperfecta, etc. So you can see there is a big list of things that we need to consider in terms of upping the risk that somebody might be more than that 1.3 and 100,000 chance, which means, screams to me, pro forma, 
in the subjective examination. So what about these folk who come in and you think they might have a cervical artery dissection already and you don't want to be moving them around too much? So, again, busy slide, I'm afraid, but this is straight from uh, a fantastic article by Peter Huybrecht, who I think, unfortunately, has recently departed this world. So our thoughts go to his family and, and him. But um, you can see there, these have been well classified into non-ischemic and ischemic events and symptoms. Broadly speaking, the uh, vertebral artery uh, patients have sort of posterior upper cervical uh, neck and head pain, uh, and the carotid artery have more sort of side of the face and anterior neck pain. Uh, the carotid artery folk are more likely to get a Horner syndrome due to the anatomy. I'll show you a slide in a second. But the other thing that comes out from the literature is this sudden onset headache. It's a sudden onset, and it's thunderclap is another description you see quoted oft and also that it's something that they've not experienced before. So maybe there is something in being able to identify these people by the pure description of the headache that they have. The five Ds and the three Ns. It's five Ds and the three Ns. There's the A for ataxia. It's the bit I always forget. So we know the five Ds, dizziness, drop attacks, diplopia, dysarthria, difficulty uh, saying the words, dysphagia, difficult, difficulty swallowing, coughing. Ataxia is a bit I forget, nausea, numbness, and nystagmus. But this screams to me, look, we need to be doing cranial nerve exams. You probably think, well, we do. But you'd be surprised how many folk don't. Cranial nerve exam, I hope, is under, in the undergraduate programs these days. It's, it's certainly in the postgraduate manual therapy programs in the UK. But, uh, you know, if we've got someone with a headache, we need to do a cranial nerve exam. That means looking at the way the eyes work, the way the eyes move, the way the face feels, the way the face moves, the way the tongue moves, the way the neck moves. You know, it's simple stuff. We need to do it with headache patients. And we also need to start taking blood pressure values for people with headaches. So, a few things to think about. How do we put all this together? We've put all that together. We're having a chat with them. We'd like to say, suggest that we do a cervical manipulation. How does the chat go? Well, we could start with we're in a good place in terms of doing a treatment that's effective. There's great evidence for the effect of manual therapy in cervical spines. You know, you summarize the evidence. You're doing something that's effective. Tim's highlighted it really nicely. So broadly speaking, doing manual therapy for the cervical spine, good thing to do. Then we've got this paper. And this paper has thrown me into a bit of an angst because what this paper has very effectively looked at is the rate of recovery. My little problem with a lot of RCTs and manual therapy was that we'd missed the rate of recovery. For me, manual therapy is about getting people better quicker. They'll get better if you tell them to move, but manual therapy is about doing specific work to get them better, quicker. This study has looked at rate of recovery, and the rate of recovery is the same between manipulation and, and mobilization. So this is, a, this is a, a tricky one. We're looking at the adverse events beyond the ones we've talked about. Nice review in manual therapy here. The biggest advert event, adverse event you'll get with manual therapy is an increase in neck pain, treatment soreness. 24, 48 hours equal between manipulation and, and, and uh, slightly higher for manipulation than, than mobilization, but, but not much. That may be an important part of our function. I mean, that treatment soreness may be part of our therapeutic effect. You know, if you look at what pe the pleasure pain centers are in the brain and how we, how we re reduce fear about pain, then changing it one way or another can be very useful. So, on top of that, then, we've got the possibility that we can cause a cervical artery dissection, although we have to be careful that we haven't overestimated our effect. So it's a difficult one. The consent issue is a difficult uh, problem, and kind of this is how I feel most of the time. I hope this isn't how I feel on Friday when I'm wearing that garb and being asked a few questions. So does orthopedic manual physical therapy cause cervical artery dissection? Well, look, there's a lack of evidence, but possibly, possibly. If you take the chiropractic literature based on the best available evidence out there, then it's about, at worst, 1.3 out of 100,000 patients. 
What are the risk factors? Well, many, including manipulation as one of them, and it's more in the young. Over 45, they start to get a bit less. What are the signs and symptoms? Headache seems to be a key feature in that. Neck pain is a bit variable. Headache seems to be becoming more popular. They'll have the, the five Ds and the three Ns. We'll need to look at cranial nerves and upper cervical instability. What you won't see here is response to uh, cervical screening procedures. In other words, being positive on a cervical artery test is not necessarily a risk factor that they'll have a cervical artery dissection because they're not valid. So what should be included in consent discussions? Well, the worst case scenario. You've got to explain what a dissection is and what that can cause, including death. We've got to stress the small odds on the whole, but the key thing is you've got to stress the uncertainty. There's a small chance, but what you've got to say to folk, I feel, is that you can't tell them exactly what their risk is. You can't tell them exactly what their odds are because nobody can. It's just too uncertain. In light of that, then, you need to discuss the alternatives, ranging from other mobilization to even waiting. You know, somebody comes in with a sudden onset headache, you know, wait a week. They've got much less chance of having a cervical artery dissection, you know, a week down the line. That first week's the crucial week, looking at the risk ratios. So I know some groups, if they've got a young female, less than 45, with a sudden onset headache, won't do manual, manipulative therapy for a week at least. Those kind of things. I'm not you know, here to tell you what to do, but those are kind of options when it comes to making decisions about consent. So I'm going to put the references up on uh, that top website, only that uh, I think it's useful to have these uh, when you're having these discussions in your departments, designing your pro formas. If you want some guidance that's there already, the MACP will produce some guidance that's freely available. And thank goodness to IFONT, uh, at the end of the year, there'll be something freely available on this uh, on their website, no doubt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Val. <laughs> Top scenes. All right, our final presenter this morning is Peter Westerhouse. Peter is a qualified physical therapist in the Netherlands in 1981. From there, he moved to Switzerland, where he currently practices. Since 1988, he's been teaching postgraduate courses in manual therapy in different countries in Europe and has been involved in teaching orthopaedic manual therapy education programs in Germany, Switzerland and the Netherlands. His main subject is, is teaching quick high-velocity thrust techniques. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, as you can see, I'm originally from Holland, but... I moved to Switzerland already 30 years ago, and I do most of my teaching in German, so my English will not be as fluent as the speakers before me. Um, I think to understand my lecture, you have to know a little bit the background that I still work in private practice about 20 weeks per year, and I teach across Europe, but mainly in German-speaking countries, and it's especially in the German-speaking countries where it's a very controversial issue whether we physical therapists should manipulate at all. So... My lecture comes from a clinician's point of view and from a teacher's point of view. So what are the requirements for the manipulation? Yeah. What do we need? Yeah. Well, we should have the knowledge. Yeah. What does science tell us? Yeah. When should we do it? But of course, more important, when should we not do it? But maybe the most important thing is that we need the clinical expertise, the clinical mileage, the patient mileage. You have to feel, you have to sense it when the problem needs a manipulation. But again, more important, you also have to be able to smell the rat when it doesn't need it. And then, of course, you have to have the manual skills. So what does the evidence tell us? When does it need it? Yeah. Now, Tim has been talking about clinical prediction rules, where people have been looking at factors which predict which patients are most likely to succeed with a manipulation. And if you take all these studies together, most of the studies, they have in common that you should always exclude the contraindication. You have best result if there is a peripheral nociceptive pain mechanism. And, very important, you need the segmental dysfunction. Now, depending upon which concept you're coming from, 
the segmental dysfunction is described in different terms. Some people talk about the manipulable lesion, so the somatic dysfunction, the sublux vertebra, yeah, the locked joint. So many different concepts have different terms for this. Yeah. Where I come from, we like to talk about the segmental dysfunction in the sense of hypomobility. So if this is an essential requirement, how do we find it? Now, my speakers before me have been talking about the importance of a thorough assessment, which includes subjective assessment, physical examination. And within the physical examination, the mainstays are analysis, an analysis of active movements, then the segmental assessment of intervertebral movement, the pivums and the pavums, and then, of course, also the specific instability test, which uh, Wayne has been talking about. Now, I'm going to show a few clips. Um, these are not actual patients, but these are course members. You have the course which show the same type of movements the patients had, because from a legal point of view, it's not allowed to make uh, pictures of patients. So this first woman, she has regular feeling of locking of her neck. Now, if you look at a mid cervical extension, especially on coming back, okay, you can almost see the pain coming there. Um, she had, she, so her complaints are a feeling of stiffness, a feeling of locking. But when you look at the quality of the movement, I think we can all see there is hinging translation in the mid cervical spine. And further testing confirmed that she had a mid cervical hypermobility. So we decided not to manipulate. Now, the next patient has the same type of uh, symptoms. Okay, now that was an interesting recovery of the movement. So do you think we manipulated this patient? Now, we did, but we did not manipulate the uh, mid cervical spine. We manipulated T2, T3, because if you look, especially with this extension, you see there's actually no movement at ever taking place in that area. So she would fit when Tim's story where he talked about manipulating the thoracic spine in patients complaining of a neck pain. And of course, it's not only the active movement, you have to confirm it with the physiological movements. Now, the next patient, she has a headache. She has a recurrent headache. Now look at the amount of upper cervical flexion when she moves. Can you see she does not flex at all in the upper cervical spine? With extension, there is hardly any movement in the upper cervical spine. So this is a patient we would manipulate with a longitudinal traction manipulation, occiput C1. Now, the next patient also complained of headache yeah, and the feeling of locking of the joint. When we did her active movements, she seemed to be restricted. And then we did the test that Wayne was, Wayne was talking about, the ligaments, uh, the ala ligament tests. So... I first try to slide her head towards the right, and there is no movement, which is normal. And then I move the head to the left. And can you see it? Now there is movement, which is indicative of a left ala ligament insufficiency. Now, coming from the Maiden concept, we never believe in one test in isolation. Then we have to do further tests to confirm it. So we saw this test from Wayne in the sitting position. And now again, you see for the left side, can you see I can actually side flex the head towards the right, although C2 is not moving. So this is a second test confirming yeah, there might be ligamentous instability. Now we look at the pivums, the opus occiput C1, and there is on the right side, there is a little bit of opening, and there is a little bit of atlas paradoxal movement to the left. On the other side, there is excessive opening, and there is no movement of C1 towards the right. So we are now at the third test. Now we look at rotation, which should be with a fixed C2 only 35 degrees, and she has 50 degrees of rotation. So this is again a patient which we would not manipulate. So it is the analysis of the active movements, then the confirmation with the pivots, and then the excluding with the ligamentous stability test. So when you do your passive assessment, yeah, we are looking at the good old movement diagrams, and I love them for teaching. You would like a, a joint which has a limitation and which has little pain at the end of range. Yeah? But sometimes you have joints like this. They are very, very 
limited and they are very, very locked, yeah? but also very, very painful. So you might go for a manipulation of the thoracic spine in this case, but you can also adapt your timing. In this type of uh, lockings, you can use so-called early timing, where you don't go to the end of the range with your presetting, but you manipulate from the beginning. So your th to find it, to find the manipulable lesion, you have to do your physical examination. And it's important that you put the active movements in relation with your pivots, in relation with your pavements, in relation with your specific instability test. So it's all about the clustering of the examination findings. Okay, now we know from the clinical prediction rules when to do it. Yeah? We now know how to find yeah, the manipulable lesion. Now we come to the skill. So what does it need? Yeah? What does the skill? Of course, you have to know an exact knowledge of the technique. And the way we teach the manipulation, you do sequencing of movements. It's a bit like combining movements. So you first do the first movement, then come a second movement, then come a third movement. Yeah? And then, very, very important, is the end feel with the setting up. I'm going to show two subjects. This is for the transverse thrust towards the right. There is a little bit of rotation. Yeah? And then I do side flexion extension just a little bit and you see a nice early stop it's blocked very early you have a good end fill now we get the next subject and i compare the amount of extension side flexion until i get the joint to lock rotation is more or less the same can you see i have to move much too far yeah, before you get to the end fill so this again would be a case where we would decide not to manipulate So, again, skill for the technique, you have to have the knowledge, you have to do the sequencing, you have to test the end feel, you do your pre-manipulative stretch. Yeah? Wayne talked about the importance for the pre-manipulative stretch for the vertebral artery. And then, of course, when you're sure you have done everything right, yeah? you have the right end feel, then, of course, you can apply the kinetic energy when you have the informed consent of the patient. Yeah? Because, in the end, it's all about speed. But I doubt whether this cow has given the informed consent. Yeah? But you see that the, the guy in the water skis, he's very, he's very secure that he has done everything right. He's well prepared. So now for the last two minutes, how do we teach our participants? How can we make sure that the participants have the required knowledge? They have the required clinical skills and the manual skills. Now, the way our program is set up, that the uh, participants, they have all qualified as a physical therapist, yeah, and then they are working in the clinic or private practice. And then over a period of two or three years, yeah, they do 240 hours of 60 minutes of postgraduate education of manipulative physiotherapy without manipulation. But it includes clinical supervision of patient treatments. And after that, they do a formal exam, yeah, a formal exam of a patient treatment and of their manual skills. And it's only the ones who have passed that exam, we then continue with the education to introduce to the manipulation techniques in continuing courses. And from that, they can then go into a formal IFORM-based OMT training in the different member countries. And we hope with that type, well, that we are sure that the, uh, the course members have the necessary requirements of knowledge, skills, and manual skills to safely perform the high-velocity manipulation techniques. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. Now, we have some time for questions from the audience. And what I'd like you to do is come to the microphones which are placed in the corridors and state your name and country and then the question you wish to address to the panel member. So please feel free to come and ask some questions of the panel based on the presentations this morning. Well, uh, thank you very much. This is Arthur from Saudi Arabia. Um, I've got a, uh, a question and, and, and comments I'd like you, um, uh, you know, to 
giving your opinion on it. Um, uh, for the first speaker, I would like to ask um, if we can put an attention uh, to our mind the effect of hands-on uh, as a placebo effect to the, uh, to the patient. So because, you know, the debate on uh, the effect of manual therapy uh, has been uh, crucial in the literature. Um, uh, so we've seen some of your slides stating that the patient with manual therapy and exercise has been, uh, you know, they have improved or have more satisfaction. Uh, was it by an objective um, measure or only the patient feedback or a, score, uh, a scoring system? Um, and uh, for the uh, uh, issue regarding the, uh, the CAD, is, um, although it's a, a minority of patients, but we still face some medical legal issues uh, regarding that. And the, uh, so um, I don't know if we could go for a, um, a, a kind of a scoring uh, which could indicate that the patient's having a high risk of um, uh, developing a kind of incision or, or uh, a risk of uh, developing kind of stroke uh, after the manipulation. Uh, we've uh, attended yesterday with the WCBT a workshop from Nottingham uh, talking about uh, their understanding to the CAD and it was very, very well designed. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if we could come up with more research um, on uh, like kind of a scoring system that a patient with higher score, they, they are highly, um, you know, uh, susceptible to have this kind of problem. Thank you very much. So I'll answer the first question was based on the placebo. There's, um, there's a placebo effect in all uh, treatments, general practitioner care, um, hands-on care. There's actually data, though, um, now coming out primarily from University of Florida and other places showing that the, 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 the velocity of technique, at least in the lumbar spine, changes outcomes. So patients both have hands on the, um, hands on care, but differences of impulses have a differential effect, at least on the nervous system. And I guess I would speak here and to, to maybe challenge the panel as well that when it comes to manipulation, I don't think it's really a joint technique. It's a neurophysiological technique. We're impulsing the nervous system and, and thus I think hopefully we'll get some debate about how, you know, much training we should focus on joints and how much maybe we should focus on other things. But to answer your question, there is an effect, but, um, that effect is, uh, um, we don't know exactly the amount of effect, but it, but it is there but there's truly an effect from manipulation as well. I, th I think on the, um, the future research front in terms of the risk factors, then, you know, we will need a, a, a multinational case control study, massive, massive international case control study, cohort study um, that's coordinated around the world to really answer the question about what, orthopedic physical therapists do because we don't they do as much as other professions and we're nowhere near them. We don't have a, an adverse event reporting system and there's a whole host of things that if we really wanted to answer this question properly we could do but it would mean investing in it. Now it may be the kind of thing that IFOM could get, guide and lead. Um, it would certainly fit within the, the aims of the organisation but um, you know, there's no reason why we couldn't with enough time, but it would be a massive undertaking to have to be able to sort of prioritise your risk factors, you know, with any kind of certainty. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, a nice presentation by all. I very much enjoyed that. A uh, question for Rob Worth from the United States. question probably for Dr. Hing and Dr. McCarthy. Uh, from a practical standpoint, if you do not plan on doing cervical manipulation, do you typically do or do you advise doing VBI testing during the examination? Again, if you're not planning on doing performing cervical manipulation. VBI, vertebral basal insufficiency, was the kind of old term. Um, you know, in the old days, we used to follow the Australians and, and do 15 minutes of neck turning and twisting and sitting and lying and this kind of thing. And then somebody thought, well, oh, was this valid? Uh, so now we know it's not valid. We don't, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend that with, with people. I, I would, with everyone who you're planning to move their neck around, uh, you do a pro forma 
which includes all those subjective features that we, that we talked about previously, plus the cervical artery. Um, the, the physical assessment for me for a, a query cervical artery dissection is a cranial nerve exam and, and blood, test, uh, blood pressure testing. So I, I've left the, left the rotations and extensions and things behind now just in light of the fact it could give me a, a falsely confident position and go ahead and do something and, you know, it could sway my arguments. So I don't do anything physical now beyond upper cervical instability testing. But then, of course, you can avoid the upper cervical spine with low cervical manips. You don't have to have a chin hold. You can have a cradle hold and manip the low cervical spine and not touch the head. So, you know... Sure, upper cervical instability uh, is a contraindication if you're manipulating up there, but in the low cervical spine, in, 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 within my appreciation of my scope of practice, it's not. I, th I think the other thing, too, is, in, is if you think about it, it's, it's in-range rotation, and you're going to assess in-range rotation. So you're looking at active motion. You're looking at when they do their active motion, they turn to the right, you just say, can you just hold it there? You, you, you know, very quickly... You can, you can use the Chinese count of 10, which is a lot quicker, and then you come back, and um, pretty much you've, you've screened them. So, uh, you know, as, as you were saying, in the old days, we'd do hold extension, hold rotation, hold extension rotation, and 45 minutes later, we're now on to uh, assessing them a bit more. So, yeah. Number six. That, that should be better. Uh, Jordan Miller from Ontario, Canada. My question was for Mr. Westerhouse. One of the recommendations you had for performing a manipulation um, was identifying a segmental mobility restriction using a PIVM or, or PAVM, for example. And I think Dr. Flynn may have been alluding to this um, in his answer to a previous question, but I was wondering if you had um, any information on the validity or even the reliability of such a motion palpation test and whether that's really reasonable with, uh, with our clinical skills. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, most studies have looked at this. Is if they look at the pavums in isolation or the pivums in isolation, they're not very, very uh, reliable. But it's the clustering of the examination findings. So if you see something with the active movement, then combine it with the pivum and the pavum, then you get more information. That was one of the Zito 1996 showed that. Oh, 2006, sorry. Sorry, just a follow-up question. In that study, what did they... What did they cluster, uh, or, and did they show increased validity or, or reliability in that study? Mm. Yes, they, they clustered the, the scoring of the active movement with the segmental testing on the pivums and the pavums. So um, I think they, they looked at five, five things, and if a patient had four out of five, yeah, then it increased the likelihood. Okay, thank you. I wouldn't mind commenting on that. I think that because the educational piece came up, and at least in the States, it's required from our entry into the profession. It's, uh, it's now DPT, but our entry-level professional students, you know, uh, manipulation is a required skill set for them. There's controversy over the cervical spine, I think uh, rightfully so, uh, but I would suggest that any... Um, any uh, graduating therapist should, you know, given the evidence and that we see 50 percent of what we see is low back pain, that you must be proficient at least with a core set of procedures. And I guess I would just challenge Peter to say that I don't believe that you, you require hundreds of hours um, to learn those skills. In fact, I think that we actually, uh, we, we've created artificial barriers towards learning skills. And the motor skills, like any motor procedure requires repetition, repetition, repetition. And you gain experience in the clinic clearly, but just as I expect a physician to be able to treat the common cold uh, or allergy or something like that, come in my GP, I would expect my physio to be able to treat me with my low back pain with current best evidence no matter where they, where they are or refer to someone else. Number three. Hello, uh, my name is Paula, I'm from Brazil. 
We have seen that spinal manipulation has also been effective to people with shoulder pain. As I work with shoulder pain, I have seen that most studies with spinal manipulation have shown improving pain and also in, in range of motion of the arm. So there are, there are not many studies evaluating the effects of spinal manipulation on scapular kinematics and muscle activation. I'd like to listen a little bit about this. Um, there was one study done in Holland, actually, by Bergmans um, a few years ago. Where they looked at 150 patients, and they divided them into two groups. One group received classic physiotherapy. The other group had the same physical therapy plus manipulation of the cervical thoracic region. And that group was much better after six weeks, 12 weeks, 26, and even after 52 weeks. So that's one of the studies I just I know out of hand, which they looked at cervical thoracic manipulation for treatment of shoulder patients. Yeah, but could they see any changes in kinematics, scapular um, kinematics and muscle activation? Because I know that it improves pain, but I don't know about kinematics. No, they looked at pain, yeah. pain and function um, with, a, with a, um, a quality score. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Nadine? Uh, hi, thank you very much. I have a question for Tim. Could you uh, comment on the generalizability of the clinical prediction rule for the lumbar spine? Because I think some resistance that we get is that people look at that and they say, well, that's not the manipulation technique that I use. Yeah, and I would suggest that if you don't like that, go to the BEAM trial or go somewhere else, bigger studies that say use manipulation. So our, our point, again, historically when that study came out, physiotherapists in the U.S. were only using manipulation about 3% of the time in individuals with low back pain, and we knew that was way underutilized. And around the world it was similar. So it was somewhat a big deal just manipulate them all. We, we had resistance because people thought, well, no, what if they have A, B, C, or D? So part of the impetus came out of that, well, of going there. But generalizability, like, for instance, the Hancock and, and the group where they looked at applying the rule using um, mobilization procedures in the lumbar spine showed that it did, it did not, um, it was not predictive of doing mobilization uh, procedures. Uh, you need to have thrust manipulation. When uh, Cleland and colleagues studied that rule, with, uh, they gave a group a supine thrust manipulation. They gave a group a side-lying lumbar thrust manipulation. And then they gave a group PA mobilization. Uh, the two groups that got thrust manipulation uh, improved at similar rates. The mobilization group did not. So I think the technique is less important than the patient. Um, because at the end of the day, you're rotating the low lumbar spine and low. You're, you're aiming low, so to speak, and rotating the lumbar spine and giving a quick impulse. And if we think it's more a neurophysiological response, it's probably less uh, dependent on exactly the level that we're there. And I know that's a bit heresy. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm, that we do not try to be as precise as possible because I think that gives us softer hands, gentler, more skilled movements. But it's more important to choose to do the manipulation rather than to choose which technique you do uh, and perhaps even which level in low back pain. Just make sure you aim low. And that's for the initial, okay? That gets your initial pain and disability down. And then if you want to get more refined on the third and fourth treatments, that makes total sense. But just a final comment is that, you know, we're un when we underutilize manipulation, we think we're being less risky. Well, that's pretty risky to do that. And again, I'm talking low back. Okay, at least where I come from, if patients don't get better, they get chemicals that have side effects, including death. They get surgeries that have side effects, including death. And these people go on to spend a whole lot of money on a bad health care and that harms them. So I think physios have to get out of this perception that just because I don't do something that the evidence tells me to do means that I'm not causing true harm to patients. So. Thanks. I think that's a very important point. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the conclusion of this symposium. So I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank our four distinguished speakers today. I've coordinated this symposium, and it's a truly international symposium. We've been communicating by email. I think they've done a fantastic job at bringing together four fairly coherent presentations from all parts of the world. So if you can just put your hands together and thank the speakers.